Okay, I want you guys to look at this and then wait to find out exactly why I showed it you. Have you guessed it yet? They are all farmers, and more specifically, farmers reaping a harvest. So, I wonder if I ask you, what is the toughest part of your job? What would you say? Maybe you might say, okay, I just have a difficult boss and I really struggle to have a relationship with them. Maybe you'd say, I just hate all of the tax books, all of those boring numbers, I really don't like that. Maybe it's the commute, you're just tired of that long commute to work. Maybe it's cleaning out that barn or that stable. What is the toughest thing you have to do at work? Can I tell you the toughest part of my job? Now, my job is, I'm an evangelist. I introduce people to God. I tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ. What's difficult about that? Well often I go to places, I speak to people and 99% of the time people just don't care. People could not give a tin of beans to listen to what I've got to say. And that can be very difficult at times. It is a strange call to be an evangelist. Here you are, you've been redeemed, you've been saved, you've been washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and you rest in that and you're so glad that Jesus Christ has saved you. And yet as an evangelist, God has placed a very particular burden on you where you can't totally relax because you realize that everyone else, well not everyone, but a lot of people around you you aren't saved and that creates an unrest in you and you long to see people saved. So would you do a favour for me right now? If you're listening and you're sitting there and if you really search your heart you can take it or leave it what I'm about to say. Some of you, if you're not a believer the truth is really you don't care do you? You don't care about the gospel, you don't care about Jesus Christ and if that is you would you do a favour for me? Please please would you try and cast out all distractions from your mind and would you try and concentrate and listen on this message? Even if it is just for the sake of your friends, your mother, your father, the elders of the church, all those people who would move heaven and earth to see you saved. Please, would you at least have just even an ounce of that concern for your own soul? So the text I'd like us to concentrate on today is Jeremiah 8 verse 20. It says, the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. So what does it mean to be saved? What is it exactly we're saved from? Well, there's three things. We're either saved from judgment, we're saved from sin, and we're saved from death. Number one, saved from judgment. What does it do to you when you can truly echo those words from this verse? You can say them with total honesty. We are not saved. I am not saved. What goes through your mind when you can honestly say those words about yourself? Does it cut you to the heart? Does it fill you with fear? Do you lose sleepless nights over it? Because I cannot think of a worse thing that a man or woman can say about themselves except for these four words. We are not saved. I am not saved. Me and my wife were big fans of a, a TV show called The Little House on the Prairie. Now, if you are a Christian and you're listening, you're thinking, are you trying to say if I'm a Christian, I've got to watch boring programs like Little House on the Prairie? No, I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying is, there is a, a lot of farmers in this story, isn't there? It's, it's set on a farm. And the main farmer, Charles Ingalls, you sort of watch him and he goes through many different things. And one of the, the episodes, I remember very clearly, you see Charles and he's gone out and he's scattered all of the seed, he's ploughed, he's broken up the field, he's watered the seed. All of his livelihood, everything that he's worked so hard on for months and months relies on the harvest. He's waiting to see if this crop will grow and he's waiting for that window of sunshine where he can come in and gain the harvest. He can come in and bring the harvest in and gain some money. And on this particular episode, what do you think happened? 
torrents and torrents of rain fell down and flooded all of his fields and so he ended up with no harvest but think about this just consider it i want you to picture in your mind two wagons one wagon has all of the grain all of the corn that's good that can go into the supermarkets that can be feed the people that can prosper all of that in one wagon and then the other wagon there's all of this dead grain sodden wet rotting good for nothing what is going to happen to that it's going to be cast out put on the fire no good my friend which wagon are you in spiritually are you full of life because the lord jesus christ is living inside of you or are you on this wagon which is dead no hope going to outer darkness because the bible does talk of a place called hell a place of judgment where there is weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth a place where god wrath abides forever and there is no fire exits there's no way out in this terrible place of hell so what will save you from this you may ask well some people they put their trust in the politician in Keir Starmer and Donald Trump in Kamala Harris but I'm telling you that will not save you some people they trust in their career they hope that their career will bring them through it and, and if they get a career that will give them hope and salvation some people they trust in, in in having a boyfriend or a girlfriend or getting married all of their hopes and dreams are having a family and they build their life on that but that doesn't save you some people believe in reform if I clean myself up if I'm a good person if I'm a good citizen if I'm a good boy or a good girl well then God will save me well that couldn't be even further from the truth I don't know if you remember a number of years ago Oxfam the charity there were some charity workers who were working for Oxfam and these guys they you know they'd been doing evil things to women uh, really wicked evil things and they got caught now when these Oxfam workers imagine them standing before a judge imagine if they said to this judge your honor can you not just let us off I mean after all we built wells we built schools we built houses we provided for all these people fed the community we are charity workers we've done so many good works can't you look at our good works and forget about you know this blip this this bit of wrongdoing we've done can you just let us off will a righteous judge let them off no he will make sure that they have justice justice will happen for the crime that has been committed and my dear friend that is exactly the same for you and i we cannot trust in our own righteousness the bible says we are not justified by works of the law it is only the blood of the lord jesus christ there is only one man who can save you there is only one person who can save you and deliver you from this condemnation and that is the lord jesus christ who stood in your place in the judgment and paid the fine for you and i so we can walk out of that court case forgive them okay number two we are saved from sin if i may i know this message is primarily for unbelievers but if i may could i speak to professing christians right now this might not apply to all of you but there is a few i would like to speak to if it is okay the bible says in proverbs 28 verse 13 he who covers his sins will not prosper but whoever confesses and forsakes them turns from them will have mercy it is a tragedy when christians live a double life some Christians, they were quite happy on Saturday in the pub, chanting all of these songs, all of these rude songs about footballers and, and all of this for their favourite team. And then on Sunday morning, they're singing Amazing Grace as if nothing has happened. Some Christians, they are heavily involved in the church. They, they're organising everything. They're doing this, that and the other. They're helping the church greatly. But for years and years, they've been indulging in a sin. And those people, they can often say, I want to stop feeling so much guilt i want to stop feeling like i'm unsaved i i don't feel like i'm a christian well the truth is this if that man or woman wants to be free from guilt they must turn from that sin there are some here listening who perhaps harvest by harvest you've been here such good church attendance frequenting the house of god week by week always here harvest by harvest year by year you've still been hiding this sin and this sin like a barnacle on a whale has stayed with you for many many years at this point there is something i feel i should say now i want to say this and underline it in red and put it in capital letters i am not preaching sinless perfection i'm not saying that we will be perfect and we'll never fail the man looking at you right now i have lived a double life 
at times in my Christian life. The man looking at you is a sinner. I fail God daily. I make a mess and that's why I praise God that I am not saved by my righteousness. I'm not justified by the works of the law as we've just talked about. I'm saved through Jesus Christ alone. But the issue is we have become far too casual with sin in this century that we're in. We have forgotten the solemnity of God. You see there are some people who we would look at on a, on Sunday or in the midweek meeting. We'd look at them and we would think they were converted, beautiful souls, walking well with the Lord. But if we ho- followed that person home, if we watched what they did in private, we would be in despair thinking about the double life that they've been living. Oh my friend, if that is you, do not deceive yourself. What a man sows, that he will also reap. And the man who sows to the flesh will reap destruction. Without holiness, the Bible says, no man shall see the Lord. You see, Jesus Christ didn't come into this world to to bleed and die. Crucified, crown of thorns, nails through his hands and his feet. He didn't go through agony on the cross just to be the enabler for our sin. Just to make us feel more comfortable and, and not to worry to take away our guilt, but to allow us to keep on sinning. No, the Bible says Jesus Christ came into the world to save us from our sins, to deliver us, to wipe the slate clean, yes, but to also pull us out of this sin and give us a power that we no longer turn to these sins anymore. You see, blood that cleanses us of sin may also teach us to hate the sin that once stained us. You see, judgment begins in the house of God. And I do believe one of the reasons we're looking at the leadership in our world, we're looking at what they're teaching in the schools, we're looking at everything that's rife. I honestly do believe the reason the UK is a mess is because the British church is a mess and so many Christians were not living out this book. We're doing everything we want. We're following our flesh. We're following our desires. And God cannot answer our prayers because we're we're blocking the way with so much sin. So may God help us. May God help us to not love sin any longer, but to turn from it. Because Jesus Christ, yes, he is the friend of sinners, but he is also the enemy of sin. And thirdly, and finally, we are saved from death. I want you to picture now a man who has just eaten a Sunday roast. Maybe you are that man. (laughs) And he walks into a bakery, okay, full to the brim. And he sees the lovely pastries. He sees the lovely bakewell tarts, the bread. Oh, and it looks so wonderful. And he admires the craftsmanship of the baker. Here's that man. And then another man enters into the shop. And this man hasn't eaten for two weeks straight. He's starving hungry and he sees this bread and he desperately wants some of it. Okay, now picture a man maybe walking around in the hills in the Yorkshire Dales and he's a a traveller and he's just out for the day and he's enjoying himself and he looks at this beautiful river and he sees the river flowing so lovely. This hiker so happy to see the river and he admires it. And then another man comes by and this man has been lost on the mountains for many, many days and he's lost his water bottle and he's had nothing to drink and he is desperate. He quenches for it. What do you notice about those last two men in the situations I've presented to you? They are desperate. There is one who is full and the other is in desperation. My dear friends, when the gospel is preached to you, are you quite content? You lay back, you don't care because everything's going well. Or are you desperate to know the forgiveness of God, to know the salvation of the Lord? You see, There is a remedy to all that I've been saying. And sadly, in the Bible, we read about these false preachers who would say, peace, 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 everyone, peace. But there was no peace. And he was telling them lies, the people lies. A bit like a doctor who you go to the doctor and you know you're not well. The doctor's done an MRI scan on you. But instead of telling you, you need to do this, this and this and giving you the tough news, he says, be okay. Just change your diet. Just eat a few more carrots and everything will be okay. You would say, what a wicked doctor. Why didn't he tell the truth? So I'm going to ask you to do perhaps something very, very difficult right now. If you're not a Christian, here is the truth that I think you need to face up to. At the very least, as I've been speaking, the very least for you to respond to this message, would you at least in your own mind just quietly repeat the words of this verse and say it about yourself. We are not 
saved. I am not saved. Let it sink in and dwell on those words. The four worst words. I am not saved. I'm not saved from, from the judgment. I'm not saved from the guilt of sin. I'm not saved from the wrath that is coming. My mum and dad, I look at them, they, they are saved, I know they are. My friend who I come to here with church every week, he's saved, but I, I cannot say it, I am not saved. My friend, if that is you, do not skirt around the matter. Do not beat about the bush. Face up to the truth. Be honest with yourself, that's the least you can do. Be honest to yourself and see your fate, that you are not saved. I do believe that time flies. I think we can all agree with that. If that's one thing you can agree with in my message, it's this, time flies, doesn't it? And whatever age you are, I'd imagine you can say this sentence, insert your age, I cannot believe I am this many years old. If you're 50 years, I cannot believe I'm already 50 years old. I cannot believe I'm already 70 years old. I thought that was ancient and now I'm here at 70 and it doesn't feel that old. Even if you're 14, 15, perhaps you can say, I cannot believe I'm already 15. It feels like just yesterday I was in reception. I was at primary school and all of a sudden I'm about to do my GCSEs. You see, you're not going to be young forever. You know that and I know that. Time flies, time stops still for no man. And as we think about these things, consider this. Here we have, another summer has passed. Another summer has gone already. Another harvest has passed. Harvest 2024, gone. It's finished and it'll never come back again. We will never get that again. And some of you, for years and years, you've been convicted. Maybe 20 years ago, you were convicted under the message of God. 10 years ago, you were convicted when you heard the gospel. But as the harvests go by, as the summers roll on by, more and more, you're less impressed by this truth. More and more, you just don't seem to care about this truth. If that's you, would you do a favour for me? Would you see a man on his deathbed? Look at him. Look at this man who, who, has, who has sowed so many different seeds. He's done well financially. He's sowed many seeds of wealth. Now he's wealthy. Big bank account. This man on his deathbed, he's sowed into the gym and into healthy eating. And yes, he's reaped well. He's, he's lived right into old age. He's sowed into his family, into pleasure, into all these things. He's had so much in this life. But what does it matter with this man? He's a dying man. And the one seed he did not sow into his heart all those years ago the one seed he did not receive is the gospel seed and now it's too late now he will go to hell forever if that is you see a young man this young man who has come to church since a baby a young woman who's come to church since a child week in week out hearing christ presented time after time a hundred times they've heard jesus christ preach to them and every time they've still missed it every time they said no 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 i don't need it what does the scripture say i will not strive with man forever and something else that happens as you get older something else that goes on as you get older is your heart grows harder you see the ground for some of you is parched the ground for some of you is dry there is a drought the summer sun that summer so many summers come down and they've baked on your heart where it is so dry that you feel nothing my friend if tonight, while you can still hear his voice, if tonight you can hear his voice, I plead with you, do not wait to be that man who has lost his whole life because he has lived it away from the Lord Jesus Christ. If tonight you can hear the voice of God, this is what it sounds like when you're young. It's loud, it's so loud. He says, come to me, come to me and I'll wash away your sins. Do not ignore my voice. Judgment is coming. Repent while there is still opportunity. And then time happens, and the voice of God gets quieter and quieter and quieter. Until eventually you cannot hear a thing, because something else that comes with old age is hearing loss. My dear friends, for someone listening this very night, this very night, this could be your last harvest. 
the last harvest you have known. Maybe, yes, you will live into old age, but there comes a point where, yes, God does not strive with man any longer, and you've resisted the voice of God so many times that you cross an invisible line that you don't even realize you've crossed, and you'll never come back to church again. You heard the gospel while you were young, and now you never return, and your salvation is gone forever. Friends, if you are indifferent to him now, if you don't care now, one day you will care. When you see heaven's door shut, when you see it closed, today it's not closed. Today heaven's door is open for you. Today you have opportunity to come. And if today you can hear his voice, escape now with your very life and throw yourself on the Lord Jesus Christ. Throw yourself upon the one who hung on that cross for your sin, who bled there, who died there, who in his body bore all of your sins, past, present and future, who was nailed to that cross, taking the weight of your sin, the guilt of your sin, the rottenness of your sin, and he was punished in your place so that you can have salvation. He stood in your room instead so you can be cleansed, and then he rose from the dead to give you eternal life. Oh friends, please, if you see him today, come to Jesus Christ, for he alone will save you. Let me leave you with one final thought. When the Titanic sunk, because there were so many people who were missing, outside the ferry office in Belfast, that they put a, a big sign, and the sign had a, a list with two, two lists. On one list, the title was, Those Who Are Known To Be Lost. And on the other list, it was those who were known to be saved. I wonder, if I asked you tonight, where would your name be? Is it on the list, on the side of those who are known to be lost, without hope? Or is it on the list of those who are known to be saved because you've trusted in Christ and asked him to save you? Friends, do you know, whoever you are, instantly, if you call upon the name of the Lord, that name that is here lost can be transferred unto saved right now. And it's all you have to do is call upon the name of the Lord Jesus right now and he'll save you. So if I may, I'd like to give us all an opportunity to do that. I'm not going to lead you in a prayer. Sometimes I do that, but I'd just like you now, whatever is going on in your heart right now, if you want to receive Christ as your savior, quietly, quietly, you call out to him in your own heart and tell him what's on your mind. And the God who hears all things will save you.